is 9.30. Time to get started. Good to see everyone. Let's have a word of prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the night's rest. Thank you for another day and uh, another week as we begin it on this Lord's Day, the day that your son was raised from the dead, came from the tomb. And as we reflect on the resurrection, as we gather together to proclaim his death, and we remember that he is not dead at the same time, and as we reflect on on the resurrection, and we we remember those years, uh, those words that were said all all those years ago, why seek the living amongst the dead? And we're thankful that he lives, that he's at your side, and that he is our mediator, that we can come to you through him. We're so thankful for all the blessings that are found in him. We're thankful that he sent the Comforter, that he sent the Holy Spirit that would reveal your mind, and we're thankful that those things, these things are written down, that we can open up our Bibles, we can read, we can understand, and we can make applications to our lives. Father, please be with those um, who we know are struggling. Uh, ask your blessings upon each one of them. Uh, we hope to see them later on uh, during worship, but just ask your blessings on them. Uh, please be with Brother Al as he continues to recover. Uh, please be with others um, who are not members. Please be with Gene's family. Please be with Brandon. Uh, pray that they uh, may have a better quality of health, that their health issues would improve. Uh, be with them. Be with all of us. Uh, we pray um, that we understand that our time on this earth is short and eternity is long. So help us to be preparing as you would have us. Help us to be watchful and preparing, um, knowing that we will stand before you and your son's throne one day. And then it is um, eternity with you or eternity without you. Uh, we pray that all things that are done today are done uh, according to your will and are well-pleasing in your sight. Please forgive us of our sins as it is the only way that we have any hope of heaven through your mercy and your grace. So please forgive us. We're thankful that you are so loving. Help us to be holy as you are holy and help us, uh, help us to look to your son as our example in all things. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in John chapter 4 today. John chapter 4. Last week we ended by speaking about the nobleman's son who's healed, that account, from the tail end of John chapter 4. And we basically closed out with uh, by talking about, oh, tied it to a passage in 1 Corinthians where it talks about not many noble or called. And so just spoke about some of the things associated with nobility. The word literally um, elsewhere means well-born. So we spoke about status. We spoke about wealth, spoke about education, things like that. And to this man's credit, he comes to Jesus. Let's read the account just to refresh our minds. Verse 46, so Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Might just start with that last verse. How is it the second sign? There's different possibilities. Go ahead, Rudy. So that's the first sign. 
But if you remember, we spoke about that account. Um, and, and what it speaks to is just for example, so you have the water to wine, which was in Cana. You have this miracle, which is, by the way, the water to wine is called the first miracle. This one's called the second. But in between the two, you know, it speaks about, for example, back in chapter 2, at verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So this miracle in chapter 4, it's referred to as the second sign, but what can it not be? It cannot be the second overall miracle that he ever did, <laughs> is my point. And so, how is John, what does John mean when he says that? This is now the second sign. Go ahead, Brenda. Could be the location because he's at the same place. What other possibilities are there? This is the second sign. It could be this is just the second one that is described in detail. You know, as it's like, we know what John's going to say at the end. He did many other signs that are not written down. Some signs are written down in detail. Some signs are just referred to. Jesus did signs. Other signs are gone through and you have a good bit of detail. And so it may be, that may be what's going on here. Um, there may be other options anyway to just look at the language. Um, but anyway, so we spoke about his being noble. So he goes to Jesus and he implores him. Verse 47. He implores him to come down and heal his son from the handout. I think it's interesting. They're under letter B for this one. Sometimes people find Jesus. Sometimes people are found by Jesus. Like the woman at the well. Was she looking for Jesus? Not really. Granted, they were looking for the Messiah. But when she comes to get water, it's not like she's looking for Jesus. It's not like she came there just because Jesus was there. Sometimes people are looking for Jesus. Other times, sometimes people find Jesus. Other times, Jesus finds people. You actually see that same principle. Um, I refer to it, in, like I said, in the handout. In Luke 15, you have three parables. You have the parable of the sheep, parable of the coin, parable of the sun. There are variables between those three. For example, in the sheep, how many does the shepherd have? You got 100, you lose one. With the coins, what's the ratio? She has 10 coins, she loses one. With the sons, what's the ratio? You have two sons, you lose one. So what's the point? <laughs> how much, how valuable is one? It doesn't matter if it's one out of 100, one out of 10, or one out of two. How valuable is the one? Now, with the sheep, what does the shepherd do? He goes after it. There's other variables too. What I mean by that, he goes out, he goes out looking for it. With the coin, what does the woman do? She searches where? In the house. Sometimes people can be lost outside. Sometimes people can be lost inside. The shepherd goes looking for the sheep outside. The woman goes looking for the coin inside and then you have the son what does the father do do what treated him as if he was dead the son says give me my inheritance the father gives it and at that point what at that point what does the father have to do let him go why doesn't he go chasing after him? Why doesn't he go looking for him like the shepherd looks for the sheep? The sheep, and this is, you have a lost sheep. Again, there, there's all sorts of variables in that. My, my point is, sometimes the Lord goes looking for people. Other times, people go looking for the Lord. The sheep... Maybe there's something to this, maybe not. Just consider. An animal. You have an animal. Um, you have a dog, you have a cat, whatever. 
the dog wanders off, it's lost, right? Had a dog when I was younger, dog got lost all the time. Dumbest dog in the world, don't ask me why. <laughs> dog would wander off. Did the dog know that it was lost? Well, I would say yes, just because it's not home, okay? But does the dog know how to get back home? No, it's a dumb dog. Dog didn't, right? Like I said, anyway, dog's name is Jenny, by the way. Real story. <laughs> so you had to go looking for Jenny. You had to go looking for the dog. The coin is lost. Does the coin know that it's lost? No, it's a coin. It's inanimate. It doesn't know anything. So it doesn't know that it's lost, and therefore it doesn't know it needs to be found. It's just laying under a bed somewhere until the woman finds it. The lost son, when he comes to himself, does he know he's lost? At that point, he knows he's lost. And also, he knows how to come back home, unlike the sheep. So when you're dealing with people, from what all that means is, when you're dealing with people, sometimes you have to convince them they're lost, like the coin. They don't realize they're lost. Sometimes they realize they're lost, but they don't know how to find Jesus. So you have to help them find Jesus. Or you, as you think about it, help Jesus find them. But if people know what to do, for example, those, have been, those who have been withdrawn from, they know what to do. If they realize they're lost, they can do it. They can do it on their own. Um, that, is, that is how the Lord, as you think about it, they know the, the way back. At least they should. Anyway, all that's to say, this guy, when he heard Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he goes to him and he implores him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So he goes in search of Jesus. He knows where he's at and he comes to him. Now the Lord says, verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. That rebuke shows up elsewhere. Uh, what? <laughs> Here's this guy. His son is dying. How do you feel about what the Lord says? <laughs> right? He says, he implores him, come down, heal my son. He's at the point of death. Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. <clears throat> How do you feel about the Lord's response? Okay, it's just the truth. Does it seem a little harsh? And if it does seem a little harsh, is the Lord known for being harsh? And, and let me back up. Is there perhaps more to it than, than, it, than it first appears? I'll give you another example of this. Do you remember when a certain, uh, does it call her a Canaanite woman, who comes and asks about her daughter because her daughter needs healed? And Jesus says, it's not good to give, oh, how does he phrase it? I'd have to hunt up a passage. It's not good to give the children's bread to dogs. Is that how he phrases it? Because she was, she may have been, I don't think she was a Samaritan, Syrophoenician, I think is how she's usually referred to. But you can tell she's an outsider. And Jesus is like, eh, it's not good to give bread to, it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. The woman comes back and says, yes, but even the little dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus says, great is your faith. So it's another example when Jesus says it's not good to give, take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Does that seem a little harsh? You better believe it seems a little harsh because he, in the context, she's the dog. <laughs> and so why would Jesus say that? Why, as this guy, he, you know, this guy does not come and say, we will not believe unless we see a sign, which is elsewhere, which does show up elsewhere. He comes and he says, my son is dying. And the Lord says what he says. So whether you're talking about the Syrophoenician woman or here, when the Lord seems harsh, what may he be doing? There may be teaching a lesson. What were you going to say, Rudy? Yeah, perhaps so. I wonder, just because it does seem harsh. It seems harsh on the surface. 
And um, go ahead, Brenda. Right. Right. The lesson may be as much as for him, it may be for them. Because there may be people there who have a lot less pure motives than this guy does. So, anyways, just just as you think about, it does seem harsh, but the Lord has a reason for saying it. Um, you might think about, because when the Lord says, and, and to just look at it, verse 49. Jesus says, go your way, your son lives. And so the man does what? He believes. But then as he goes on and someone meets him, okay, the servants meet him. He inquires when his son got better. And then, verse 53, then he does what? He himself believed in his whole household. Well, did he believe before or not? It's like he believed him. It's a progression. It's not like faith. But the way I always put this, and it sounds funny to say it, but you'll, faith is not binary. Anybody from school days remember what binary technically means before this, then age Rudy? What's binary? There's only two possibilities, on or off. That's why in the whole gender discussion, people say, oh, we're non-binary. They don't believe there's just male and female. They think there's also cats and dogs. Anyway. Like, no, there's two. Well, faith is not binary. Faith is not you believe all the way or you don't believe anything at all. It's like, no, you know the man believes in Jesus because what does he do? He comes to Jesus. It's like, well, why would you come to Jesus if you did not think that Jesus could do something about it? So did he have a measure of faith already? He had to have a measure of faith. And then Jesus says, and we'll explore this more, Jesus says, go your way, your son lives, and what does he have? More of a measure of faith. He believes. And then he sees the proof in the pudding, and then what does he do? He believes. And it's like, faith is not on or off. We can grow in faith, we can shrink in faith. Now, at some point, you may have no faith. <laughs> and of course, in heaven, faith is going to be made sight. but there is a, um, you might just think about a scale, for lack of a better way of putting it. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I will say this is not the centurion. Centurion is someone else, but nobleman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he doesn't, he obeys when the Lord says, go your way. The original request was, Come down. Now the centurion's different because what does the centurion say? You just give the word. Okay, so at that point, when the centurion says, you just give the word, this man says, come down, who has more faith? The centurion has more faith, and Jesus says, I have not, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. Others had a measure of faith, but not enough to say, you just give the word. This man, and it's, it's just interesting that in the different miracles, we see different levels of faith. So some of the examples uh, in the handout, I give the example of the centurion. He knew Jesus just has to give the word. The woman with the flow of blood, what does she think she has to do? It's like, if I just touch the hem of his garment. And it's like, well, do you really have to touch the hem of his garment? No. Does Jesus really have to come down? No. It's like you just give the word, and that's enough. That's what the centurion understood. I will say, oh, let me let me look in my notes. It's just interesting to think about, for the sake of it, those three examples. The woman who says, I have to touch him. The centurion who says, just give the word. The nobleman here who says, please come down. Some people needed to see signs, right? They needed, they needed to see signs. 
And what it speaks to is, do you remember the man who's deaf? He may have been mute. I think he was mute and deaf. And the Lord heals him. You remember how, anybody remember how the Lord healed him? He spits on the ground and he spits into the mud, makes a little, you know, makes a little malleable, a little clay, puts it in the man's eyes. I can't remember if it's that guy or another guy where it talks about he puts his fingers in his ears. Huh? Maybe he was blind. Anyway, Jesus did a lot of miracles. <laughs> in some of those miracles, it's like, why did Jesus do that? Was it miracle mud? So why does he do that? Why, why would he do that? But it's written down so we can ponder it. So we're going to ponder it. <laughs> go ahead, Bruce. Well, there was something he had to do. He had to go and walk. He had to do something to make it all work out. And, and so to think, of, because there are other miracles, like Bruce just mentioned another one. Someone had to go wash. Well, technically, could the Lord have just, and it's done? He could have. So why is it some people have to go wash? Why is it some people, it's like, wait a minute, what's the Lord doing? He's spitting on the ground, and you're going to put it in his eye? Ugh. <laughs> I, I would suggest the possibility is, what does the Lord say the people needed to see? You need to see a sign. You need to see a sign. The woman, I need to touch the hem of his garment. If, I heard a preacher one time, and, and don't take it the wrong way. There's a little bit of showmanship there, and not in a bad way, but that so people could know Jesus was the one doing it. That it wasn't just happening. It wasn't, it wasn't just a coincidence. It's not just, oh, my son got better. It's like, oh, okay, you know, the nobleman, what do you think he'd been doing for his son for a long time? He'd been praying probably the whole time. And so if his son just got better, what would he think? Oh, I don't have to go see Jesus now. So when he goes home and he inquires from the servants, what time did he get better? And they say from 3.30 or whatever it was yesterday. And he's like, that is the exact moment when Jesus said he lives. And it's like, if, if the son, if the servants would have said, well, he's a little better, what would the man have thought? Well, he's a little better. Uh, you know, what if he would have gotten better a day later? Well, maybe, maybe there's something to Jesus, but maybe not. But the fact that it was, he got better when Jesus said it got better. It's like, oh. He believes him and all his household. Go ahead, Rudy. Right. The crowd stops. <laughs> remember when the voice comes from heaven at, in one of the occasions and Jesus says it did not come from me it came for you now the voice said like it said often this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased or whatever it said at that point um, but it's like did Jesus need that voice so that he could know he's the son of God no he knew this was for others he specifically says this was for others and so when others would see, like I said, pardon the phrase, the showmanship, the, these, these outward things that he did not have to do. It's like, he didn't have to do that. I mean, it's not like, it, it's just, 
there are some things in the Bible that are just bizarre. Uh, okay, there, there are things along the lines that are just bizarre. He did not have to do that any more than coming up in John chapter 5, a certain angel came down and stirred the water and the first person who got in was healed. Well, did the angel really have to stir the water? It's some things, now to Nancy's point, some things are above our pay grade. <laughs> but you think about why the things are happening. It's like, oh, so people could see sign, even the word that is used to describe the miracles, signs and miracles and wonders. They signified something, signs signified, they signified something, and they were beyond Natch, they're beyond nature, miracles, and they're wonders. And it's just like, what? <laughs> and it's like, anyway, uh, Brenda, was your hand up a second ago? I'm thinking. <laughs> I was thinking about because people make that point with the storm when he calms the storm. It's like he is showing his authority, and that's what the disciples say. Who can this be that even the wind and the wave obey him? He has authority over nature. Did he have to calm that storm and other to get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee? Did he have to? No. But they're scared. And he's calming their fears and showing his power. And it's like, if I have power over the wind and the wave, if I have authority over the wind and the wave, then I have authority over you too. And guess what? When they get to the other side of the sea, guess who shows up? The demons, legion. Guess who else I have power over? Um, here, my son is sick. Oh, so he has power over sickness. From a long distance, and then Lazarus. I have power over death, and it's at some point you say, "Well, what does he not have power over?" And what it all what it all really points to, and let's you see it in the paralytic man. The paralytic man is let down in front of him, and what's Jesus say? "Son, your sins are forgiven you." And what's everybody start to say? Who do you think you are? They're, if they're not saying it, they're thinking it. <laughs> and Jesus says that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. I say, take up your bed and walk. If he has, and he takes up his bed and walk. What's the point of the miracle? Was it just so this guy could go on about his life? Or was it to show that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins? The age of the miraculous is going to come to a close. And people are like, oh, well. And, and they, they think everything, everything hinges on the miraculous. When we think about salvation, our salvation does not hinge on the Lord healing our family members from an earthly sickness. Our salvation does not hinge on the Lord calming the storms up at Lake Erie. Our salvation does not hinge on those things. Our salvation hinges on the forgiveness of sins. So when Jesus, when we finally get to Matthew 28, and he says, all authority has been given to me in, he in, hev in heaven and on earth, the question becomes authority to do what? To forgive sins. That it all points to if he has power over this, 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 then he has power over everything, just like Scripture says, and he has the power to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He has the power to forgive us of our sins. That's the sort of power he has. Anyway, any other questions, comments, anything along those lines? His whole The, the nobleman, back to the nobleman, his whole household believes. Um, he himself believed and his whole household, verse 53. 
And it's just a wonderful thing when whole households believe, when they become believers. You see this in Joshua in the Old Testament, right at the end of Joshua's life. Choose for yourselves whom you will serve this day. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see it with Lydia when Paul meets Lydia. She's the one who they're at the riverside, right, where the women customarily came to pray. And Lydia believed and her house, her household. And then the Philippian jailer is right after that account. And the Philippian jailer believes and his household. Cornelius, you see the same thing. There's probably others. I've always thought of across the road here, two young girls are always out playing underneath that tree, playing all the time. Um, pushing a baby in a little baby cart while they're riding some sort of scooter. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know those girls' names. How much influence do I have on those little girls? Not much. How much influence do I have on that little girl? <laughs> it's like, that's the low-lying fruit. My family is the low-lying fruit. I may not have influence on anybody else, but who should I have influence on? My family. At the very least, I should have influence on my family. And so you see this just as he believes and his whole household. And this is the second sign. Um, on to the questions. We've already answered the rest of them. The rest of them pretty much pertain to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. But question eight deals with the nobleman. And the question is, what reasons could the nobleman have had for not coming to Jesus? What excuses could he have made? Too far away? He's got to, he's got to travel a distance, right? Because it says, let's see. Notice verse, Jesus, Jesus tells him, go your way. Verse 52, he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said yesterday at the seventh hour. So it was a good distance, right, from where he came. So he could have said, ah, it's just too far. What else could he have said? He's about, it's like, he's, he's a nobleman. Jesus is not a nobleman. <laughs> Jesus is the carpenter's son. So he could have said, I'm not lowering myself to that. He could have said, I'll just wait till he comes back. I'll just wait. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, to think about the, the guy's faith. In order to come to Jesus, who does he have to leave at home? The dying son. So what could he have said? My son needs me. The truth is, who did the son need? Jesus. He had to leave his son behind to come to Jesus. Anyway, he could have probably said other things. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I don't know what Jesus would have done if when, I'm trying to think if there's an example. If when Jesus says, go your way, your son lives, if the man would have said, no, you've got to come. You have to come with me. I, whether Jesus would have done that or not. Don't know. <laughs> don't, don't know. Um, to his credit, he comes thinking Jesus has to come back with him. And when Jesus says, go your way, he obeys to the man's credit. So he goes from thinking Jesus has to come to believing he does not have to come. And he's on that, that journey. Any other questions or comments before we get into the next lesson? The next lesson is even more bizarre because <laughs> the next lesson is the angel stirring up the water. Um, let's see, let's check our time. Let's just read it. John chapter 5, verse 1 now. 
After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. We'll go ahead and pause there. Um, in the handout, John gives a time stamp for it. After this, there's a feast of the Jews. Most, are, most scholars are of the opinion that this is the Passover. The only issue with that being the Passover is over in chapter, and there's a reason I might think this is getting very technical. You'll understand why this somewhat matters here in a second. The problem with this being the Passover is over in chapter 6 at verse 4. It talks about the Passover. And so what most scholars think is that there was a year in between these two accounts. And they don't, they don't, scholars don't really have a problem with that. Commentators don't have a problem with that. Because, I mean, basically everything from John chapter 11 on is like the last week or two. Um, and so what John's doing is filling in certain gaps, and there may be large chunks of time where the other Gospels, the news that has already gone out, the good news that has already gone out, have explained what's happening in those gaps. So John doesn't feel like he needs to cover the exact same territory. And so they're okay if in between John chapter 5 and John chapter 6, there's a year. Why all of that, why all of that may matter to some is because these timestamps that John gives is how people get to the Lord's ministry being three years. So that's how they get to that mark. Don't consider this blasphemy when I say this. Does it really matter in the long run if the Lord preached three years or four years? I don't think so in the grand scheme of things. But anyway, these timestamps that John gives, that's how it's determined typically three years. But you might just think about it. So here it is. There's a feast of the Jews. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. Why does he go to Jerusalem? There's a feast of the Jews. When there's a feast of the Jews, what do all the able-bodied men have to do? You got to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is born under the law. What law is that? That's the Mosaic law. It's like this is what has this is what what is done. So Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. There in Jerusalem, there's this pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, um, having five porches. There's a great multitude of sick, blind, lame. From the handout. In neither this miracle nor the Lord's miracle was everyone healed. Does the Lord have the power to heal everybody there? Yeah, he could have. <laughs> Did, again, don't ask me to explain the angel stirring up the water. Other than this, if the angel did this, what does that mean? Had to, who was he doing it by the authority of? God. God had to have authorized it. When God authorized that angel to do this, was everybody healed? Did God have the power to heal everyone? Well, that seems kind of mean. Because <laughs> people are going to say, so God allowed all the rest of those people to suffer? Jesus allowed all the rest of those people to suffer. And what's the answer you have to give. Yeah, he did. So you might think about another passage while it's not physical suffering or it's not um, 
physical ailment. In Mark chapter 14 of verse 7, it's where the Lord says, you have the poor, it's when someone's anointing him, I believe is that account. And they're arguing, it's like, well, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? And Jesus says, the poor you always have with you, and you can do them good any time you want. Is there always going to be, as long as we're on this earth, are there always going to be needy people? Why? <laughs> because it's not heaven. <laughs> it's, like, it's not heaven. It's not meant to be heaven. And a part of it not being heaven is not only, and we'll come back to it here in a second. Uh, man, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. The reason, and, and the Lord says, the poor you always have with you, and you can do them good whenever you want. By leaving poverty, the Lord allows us to fulfill it is more blessed to give than receive. If everyone's needs were already seen to, how would we ever have the opportunity to help? You could say the same thing about suffering. Why does the Lord allow suffering? Why did the Lord allow suffering with Paul, the thorn in the flesh? He prays three times, let it be removed, the messenger from Satan. The Lord says, my grace is sufficient. In weakness, there's strength. If we were all strong as horses our whole lives, what would a lot of people never learn to do? Be grateful and lean on the Lord. <laughs> no, you're going to lean on your own strength. Right? It's like, so the Lord allows it for a reason. Pat, your hand up was up a second ago. Yes. Bruce, was your hand up a second ago? It's okay if you say no. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, you, you have to deal with the issue. The Lord allowed a whole lot of other people to be sick. These people who are here, this is not one person at the side of the school. This is one person amongst a multitude, and the Lord heals him. Now, I will say this. If you're all those other people, and this goes back to like our previous point about other people seeing it, if you're other people there, what are you thinking? Uh, rather than putting your faith on that angel, who should you maybe put your faith in? Jesus didn't even have to stir the water up. <laughs> he just gives the word. And the man does this. We, we have, go ahead, Bruce. I was going to say, it's, it's quite amazing. You know, this, this gentleman, he's been there for such a long time. Yep. Um, he, he tells Jesus, every time it's stirred, someone else needs to be there. Right. Why is he still waiting there? He Apparently, has hope. Somehow, he's going to get in there. But how many of us would wait years and years to be put in that water? Yeah. We'd probably give up, and that, that'd be it. You know, the, the miracle, one of the questions I would have, it's like, why does the Lord, again, it somewhat seems harsh when the Lord says, do you want to be made well? I've been here for 38 years. What do you mean do I want to be made well? I wonder if part of it is here in the last minute or two. He says, the, the man says, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. Could no one help this guy for 38 years? For nearly four decades, no one could help this guy and say, listen, he's been waiting since the 70s. And no one could help this guy get to the water. No one could say, you're going to have to wait till next time. This guy's been here for 38 years. Uh, I know. And I don't know how often the angel came down. If it was once a year, I, I don't know that. Um, another, another thing to consider also, and with all the Lord's healings, here... So what's the man been doing for 38 years? He's been laying here, and you might notice, so what is it? how does it phrase it? Multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. I wonder if part of this is sort of like the man laid at the gate in the book of Acts. They're begging. 
right? They're begging. They're, they're not able to function in society, right? They're not able to hold down a job. They're not able to, they're not able to live a normal life. They are abnormal in that sense. And when the Lord heals them, what did they have to do? They became normal. So now what are you going to have to do? Follow the law. Get a job. Rather than being dependent on everybody else, you're going to have to... People have been not helping, but also probably helping this guy. It's like he's survived for 38 years. He's going to have to help others now. All that's to say this. When the Lord says, do you want to be made well? Guess what some people do not want to do? Some people do not want to be made well. Some people want to beg. Some people want handouts. Some people, that's lifestyle. I'm not saying this guy was, but when the Lord says, do you want to be made well? I don't think the Lord's just talking to hear himself talk. There's a lot of people who prefer to be, a, to, to be dependent on everyone else rather than have others depend on them. Go ahead, Nancy. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. 38 years has gone by. He may have gone from, he may have gotten sick in his 20s, and he's now in his 60s. It's like, this is a whole new life. Now, I will say, when the Lord, when the Lord heals him, is he healed? Oh, he's healed. When the paralytic man, when the when the paralytic man does the same thing, take up your bed and walk. I don't think the man who was healed was like, oh, my back. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh-uh, I don't think so. But to Nancy's point, it's been a long time since he's been normal. So anyway, you might just think about it. I, I just think there's more, there's more to when the Lord says, when the Lord says, do you want to be made well? I don't think he's just talking to hear himself talk. So we'll go ahead and stop there and we'll pick up talking about the same account next week. Good to see everyone.